should ask them to pay something for their study. And it's a sort of thin end of the wedge uh, in Australia because from there on in it grew into a multi-billion dollar annual industry. Um, globally, international students have been on the rise for as long as we've looked at this. Um, today, I mean, in 2010, the figure is 4.1 million. Today, it's more than 5 million, and it just keeps going up. Nevertheless, it's still something for the elite. Only 2.3% of all students enrolled globally in higher education actually make it to go across the border. This is just another graph to show you what I just told you. The numbers are just on the increase. We won't waste time with that. The distribution is very uneven. Um, you might not be able to read it, but the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Australia and Canada, those countries together have about 50% of the globe's population of students who want to get a degree in another country. Six countries. But more and more countries coming on stream with this idea. There's, of course, also enormous variation from time to time. We won't worry about it. Another form of um, internationalization activity is that of international exchange. Now it's not students going to another country to get a degree, but they're studying at one university and they'll spend a short time going to another university, one semester. Sometimes it's shorter, it's uh, 10 weeks, six weeks, sometimes it's a whole year. Um, again, Europe is sort of figuring strongly in that through the Erasmus program. In 1987, they sent 3,000 students on the Erasmus program around Europe. Now it's about 80 times that number annually. More than 250,000 students move under Erasmus funds to spend part of their study somewhere else. In the United States they, States, they practice something a little bit different. You, it used to be that the, the fine ladies in liberal arts colleges absolutely had to go to Rome or Paris to see some of the artworks themselves. And out of that grew this idea that for lots of disciplines it was good for students to spend one semester away from the home campus to become internationalized. And in Asia-Pacific, a uh, similar sort of Erasmus-type scheme uh, was also implemented, not so important. 2.3% of students go abroad. Add to that those that go abroad for a short while and say about 90% of students don't go anywhere, they stay at home. And about a decade and a half ago, Hanneke Tekens and a number of other people, Bank Nielsen, here in Europe started talking about internationalization at home. And the Australians jumped on that bandwagon. They said, right, we're inviting international students so that our home students, our local students, become internationalized. That was the, the, the catch cry with which we went out and recruited students uh, um, by the large numbers. But the true meaning of internationalization at home was about inclusiveness, diversity, um, reciprocity in education, um, making the curriculum suitable for students from somewhere else. Now, to some people it meant, okay, now we give our program in English, and now it's suitable for people from outside. Some people went even further and said, well, it's got to be relevant to them, so let's think about the content, the disciplinary content, and is that suitable for students? Let me give you a very simple example. We have a hotel management program here. It's a food and beverage bit, you can feel it coming. The beverage bit, the alcoholic drinks, in Qatar we can't give it. So we have to think about how do we do that in Qatar because Qatari students, Muslim, can't taste the alcohol. That's a very extreme example. Well, all these activities can be scaled up and truly I got the feeling, you know, if we do it more, it's going to be better. The problem was that we simply presumed that if we did more, then more students would become internationalized. And unfortunately, that wasn't proven. The gut feeling was there, and we saw students come back, and they were different. They had different characteristics. But in terms of intercultural competence, we weren't all that sure. So as I said to you, um, about a couple of years ago, people such as Jane Knight and Hans de Witt here today um, started to ask some serious questions about are we on the right track? Should we just do more, 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 or should we just stop for a moment? And 
uh, Jay Knight and Hans Sule both had uh, a set of misconceptions or myths about internationalization, and I'm not going to really go through all of them, but just to highlight one or two. Um, if you invite inter international students, then you have a, immediately an international classroom and an internationalized curriculum and an international environment. That was how the Australians went out and sold it. Um, there were problems with that, not the least of which that when you invite the Chinese community from Malaysia and the Chinese community from Thailand and the Chinese community from China and the Chinese who were at home into a business program and they look around sitting in the class, it was a Chinese class and students got really cheesed off with that. That's an extreme example. Um, <coughs> internationalization because then we're really globally strong. If we're internationalized, we're fantastic. Or if we have a good international reputation, we have fantastic quality. And of course, they're all misconceptions. If we teach in English, that'll internationalize the students. Another serious misconception. I want to add one to their list. If you grow globally high ranked, then everything is dandy. Well, if you're a bachelor student wishing to be transformed, wishing to sort of make a step, you're better off, I think, with an institution that's capable of giving you a big change as a person, rather than one where research um, is the best in the world. Because does that mean, is the teaching also good to you? Of course, if you're a research student, try and go to the best in the world. Absolutely no doubt about it. And global ranking, unfortunately, and that's the misconception, has become a proxy for quality. And I've spent long enough on this to tell you that that's absolutely not true. There is a, a grain of truth in it, but it's not uh, as much as we, we bank on it right now. So let's talk about these definitions, because I think if I'm to start a research group here that's going to look at this issue, you need to have the right starting point. And I've already given you the most simple definition. Internationalization is a response to globalization. Yeah, but some of the activities are globalization in itself, because when we send students across the border, we're globalizing. Not a very handy definition. It's also not new internationalization. In uh, Bologna in 1158, uh, the Authentica Habita was proclaimed by Frederick Barbarossa. And that essentially allowed international students and staff to freely come and go. Big thing. Local staff, if a professor wanted to go, you like this, if a professor wanted to go on a trip, he had to leave a big deposit at the university financially to ensure that he would return and come and teach again. Yeah, you're not running away from us. That's an excellent idea, yeah. Well, I'm not giving you any deposits. <laughs> Leiden University, I can take Groningen University, they're all, of course, throughout their uh, existence have had significant cohorts of foreign students. And in the 1990s, internationalization became really the, the fashion trend almost. Everybody was talking about it. Now, the first definition we have all worked with, without fail, was that by Jane Knight. And she said, uh, I'm going to translate this for you, add an international dimension to the normal functions of your institution and things will become internationalized. Now, I'm, I'm going a bit fast on this, but you, know, um, you need to add an international source to your curriculum. You need to make sure you have international people on campus. You need to know, you need to have relationships with institutions abroad. And you can think of this not just at the institutional level, but at the sector level, sort of nationally as well. Um, and for university management, this definition is absolutely fabulous. How many international students have we got? Now we've got a bit more. Oh, we're on our way to internationalize. Now we've got a bit more. That's very handy. You know, I call it tick the boxes and add up the numbers. And the more you have, the more international you look. And this is also part of the new U multi-rank, where the international dimension is your international faculty, the number of international or proportion of international students. The more you have, the better you are. Um, it was a really good definition that got us going on internationalization. It made us all jump into action. <coughs> a bit closer to where we want to go was that uh, six years later by Betty Leesk, and she talked about internationalization of the curriculum. And not just the formal curriculum, but also the informal things that happened. 
And I'm talking about um, the, the social activities, the social engineering that happened outside the classroom, the fact that you had, ha had halal food available for Muslim students on campus, you had prayer spaces, those sort of things. You had gatherings where international and uh, local students would come together. You had a buddy system. And you looked at the curriculum and very specifically put things in there to a, serve the needs of the receiving students, B, ensure that your students got a sense of intercultural competence and international awareness. Betty Lee's got a lot closer. Um, I want to go one step further with this because um, I feel that, um, and, and let me just quote a few people, uh, Hans and Elspeth Jones wrote a paper on that internationalization is increasingly the norm. And in fact, you can't walk into an institute of higher education that takes itself seriously and they talk about their internationalization activities. Some more, some less, but everybody talks about it. But there are very different interpretations, also at a, a global level. As I've told you, the Australians had this sort of commercial outlook. The government squeezed the universities out of funds. We need to do something to keep things going. So what? Invite international students who pay fees and we stay afloat. Or programs that had very few students. Well, if we can recruit some more students from outside of our normal recruitment area, across our borders, then we can keep this program alive. And with that, preserve the variety of programs we have. So uh, that's one way. Another interpretation was the more academic one. We want our students to get experience in another culture, in another institutional culture, etc. Um, Hans and uh, Uwe Brandenburg wrote a really nice uh, a polemic essay to really sort of drive things to a, a point and, and, and say internationalization is dead. Um, it's become a means uh, onto itself and that's not what we want. What really um, tickled me was in a paper of Elspeth and uh, uh, Jones and Killick in this year. Um, if you look at all the things we've talked about, adding an international source to the things you do, um, changing your curriculum so students who experience the curriculum get a, a different sort of experience because you've thought about the international aspects, none of that really talks about the learning outcomes. And if you talk about our disciplinary content these days, it's all about learning outcomes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no longer about just what you put in. Um, home and abroad, that's becoming increasingly um, a vague sort of notion. Why? Well, information can be had from anywhere in the world. I can read courses from MIT or any other fancy university I like who puts their material on the internet. I can do blended learning, some at home, some at an institution, uh, some distance education, some uh, um, education at the university. I can go and do an Erasmus Mundus program and go to three different universities. So which one of those three is my home university? Gets a bit complex. So to, to simply divide internationalization activities on the basis of where they happen is, I think is a bit complex. If you invite lots of international students and you do things that you put under the banner of internationalization activities at home, for the students coming from afar, this is not at all at home because they just moved onto your campus. So it's a perspective issue and maybe um, doesn't really need our, our focus. What is quite clear is that we're going to have to measure what happens to students, and it's not easy. Um, there's an increasing body, uh, an increasing literature that deals with how can we measure what happens to students? How can we measure intercultural competence? How can we measure international awareness? Uh, and I'm not actually going to um, go through the, the things I've got here, but we change from looking to see what students get out of it instead of what we put into them. That's, the, that's the, the thing I want you to keep in your mind. Yeah, we, we used to, if you give them all the good oils, then they become great students. 
Now we say, well, let's facilitate their learning and let's test and see whether they've got the outcomes we thought that our activities that we do with students actually lead to the result. Now, um, I've also sort of taken a good look at the literature in terms of um, what do you get out of it if you participate in internationalization activities? And Dala Deardorff, um, she's sort of, um, I guess, one of the key players in the intercultural competence arena, uh, took once a look at some 49 papers trying to define intercultural competence. And 49 papers had 49 sort of definitions for it. That's not helpful. So she used a, a technique in which she looked at both scholars in the intercultural competence world and she looked at administrators. And then through a technique called the Delphi method, basically, you know, you keep sort of discussing things and you show people what comes out of the discussion, you end up hopefully with some common ground. Now, with the administrators, that was easier, just summing it up, easier than with the scholars. Scholars like to sort of be more precise about this. Administrators want something, one source fits all. Uh, plain vanilla. If we can have one type of workshop to make everybody interculturally aware, great. Well, I've already discovered in this institution that our standard intercultural competence training workshop, if we take that to the School of um, Social Work and Arts Therapy, they'll come once to something like that and we'll never see them again because for them, they're at a different stage, they're at a different platform compared to, say, um, the, the guys and girls in, uh, in technology. So differentiation of approach is somewhat important. Um, Dala found that um, you can't just take a single measurement and see how intercultural someone is. It's the change you see over time. And that led her to suggest a, a process orientation to measuring and developing intercultural competence. Michael Page did a number of studies, including a very big one with some 1,300 students. Uh, and I just, um, uh, one, he created a, a, an intervention by way of guidebooks. And with these guidebooks, um, he tried to push the intercultural development, second, lang second language acquisition, and the employment of learning strategies to sort of get this uh, intercultural competence at a different plan. He found with that first study, uh, with this intervention, that there was a positive in impact on intercultural competence. So you couldn't just send your students away and some uh, friends of mine at Bellarmine and uh, Willamette University have done this recently. They sent students away. These students came back and they measured before and after the intercultural competence. No change. Very little. Then they started doing interventions with these students and they noticed we get more of a change. And in this very large study of Michael Page with 1,300 students, he got some sort of, I think, fairly positive outcomes. Uh, mobility produces more intercultural competence and oral proficiency in a target language if part of the, the job was to learn a foreign language. So American students going to a Spanish-speaking country and they want to learn Spanish. Well... Doing that, rather than staying at home, caused more uh, uh, oral proficiency in the target language. Um, the, uh, let me use a, a bit of French. The more boorish you were, the more insulated life you had, the less you were aware of other cultures, uh, the less intercultural competence you had, the more effect you had by doing something like this. So if you had a low starting point, you <coughs> made a much bigger leap. The biggest effect to be had was with a well-trained intercultural mentor who helped you reflect on what's happening to you. Look, you've just landed in Indonesia, you look around, it's all very different. What's happening to you now? How do you feel? You've had your first discussion with an Indonesian person. How did that go? What did you notice? So someone who sits there and, and asks for these things will get a lot of aha moments in the students and a lot of movement in their intercultural competence. Okay, when we invite international students, they have all sorts of backgrounds. If here at Stenden, we have Bulgarians, we have Chinese students, we have students from 
the Netherlands and from another uh, 60 or so countries. And they all come and study here. We all lump them together and say, now get on with it. We really need to think about where do you come from and what have you got as baggage to bring to the place. Now we do here a lot of professional, professionally focused education, but it also happens at our universities, doctors, lawyers, dentists, but we do managers here and social workers, all professional. The next place after studying is the workplace. Engineering has always has a tough time getting students after their bachelor to come back and do a master's or a PhD. Why? They're earning big bucks out there. They don't want to come back. So the workplace is the next station. So we need to think about where do they come from? Where do we send them to? And I think that we're in the right position to take charge of that chain. Secondary education, they're with us, then we send them out into the workplace. Let's just keep it simple for this discussion. So the first thing we need to do is go to the workplace and say, what do you want? Say, Quackerelli Simons did a study. They talked to 23,000 businesses and said, is it of any use to you that um, a, a candidate has international experience? And 53%, yes, wonderful. If you dared asking the second question, well, what is it in the international experience, that you would have been met with a stony silence. They haven't really sort of thought it through themselves. It's very difficult, very tricky, but it, I think it needs to be done. So, I want to put the learner in this whole process where we put the learner in terms of the disciplinary content right in the middle of things. And so my first shot at trying to create a learner-centered definition was, and I'll read it out to you, internationalization of higher education constitutes the provision of an environment containing such elements that a learner is given the opportunity to attain achieved learning outcomes associated with two things, international awareness and intercultural competence. Sure, the global citizen and we can have all sorts of other laudable things but I'm now just zooming in on professional education I'm saying yes of course I like hotel managers who understand that we need to do something about the global warming or that we need to have sustainable uh, hotels but even more do I want to define more clearly what it is in terms of intercultural competence they need on the work floor so I need to go and talk to hotels and they need to tell me exactly what it is they want and if they can't then I first need to educate them about the sort of things they could possibly want and then they need to work it out and say well this would be handy for us and these are problems we come across and this literature is at the moment slowly going but doing that using this as a definition ignores what I just said these students come from somewhere and we're going to send them to somewhere so um, I want to add one extra sentence to this definition namely that higher education recognizes and actively links with other phases in the lifelong learning chain. I think we need to be in the driving seat here and we need to take this opportunity and we need to run this show and we need to invite industry to come and talk to us about it. In, in the Stenden situation, what I have in mind is we have all these advisory boards for every program well, we need to go and work with each of these advisory boards and talk about international awareness and intercultural competence and ask, what do you want for your particular discipline? So no longer a source that can go out over the whole institution in one flavor. We need to carve the cake up. And this is exactly what Simon Dausma is now doing with the, the work in working with individual programs and saying, how do you move from where you are now to the next step? And what is it you want in your program in terms of intercultural competence? Of course, we will find that there are some generic elements, some that crosses everything, but there'll be a lot of specifics. What a hotelo needs compared to a social worker will be quite different things. So we should recognize it and work with it. Okay, that's my, my little throw at a starting point. It's about the chain of organizations involved. It puts the learners, the learner is going through this chain of situations. 
So we place the learner central in this whole definition, just like we do for disciplinary knowledge. And um, we need to align, so uh, just briefly on the secondary education, um, we need to go into a dialogue with them. Once we know what industry tells us they want, um, we need to look at how do students come out of high school and then let's see how we bridge this gap to where we send them to. Now, it may be that we can talk to schools and say, look, you could do a bit more of this or a bit more of that. That's the role that I think we should do in higher education. We should lead that. Uh, class, we were already touched on this. Is Stenden fit for this purpose? Is Stenden the right place? Um, the first thing I need to tell you is that in a staff questionnaire, 70% of the staff thought that internationalisation was the most important strategic pillar. So a big thank you. You've made it possible to, for Stenden to focus on this. You all make it um, as an important element of the way forward. And hallelujah, uh, it's my chance to help this organisation go forward by working with you. I know I've got a very receptive audience to work with me and look at the students. We have very many international students. 25% on the campus in the Netherlands, if I add the foreign branch campuses to the mix, and they have at times even higher percentages of foreign students. So I'm not saying, oh, all the South African students in South Africa, I'll add them to my international students. That's a cheap trick. I won't do that. But the international students in South Africa, and increasingly we're getting students there on the campus from the so-called SADC countries, the surrounding countries of South Africa. And in Qatar, we have a very high percentage of foreign students. Same in Bali. So when you throw all that in the mix in a proper way, we end up with 27% international students. Our pedagogical methods, I, I really do want to say something about that. In 2004, I was at a conference organized by Bank Nielsen in Malmö. Bank Nielsen is, by everyone, considered to be the father of internationalization at home. And we had, at that time, roughly, on average, 20% of international students on Australian branch campuses. 10% of European students were mobile. In other words, they left home and they went somewhere else. So there were reasonable numbers of international students everywhere. And we all faced the same problem. These international students said, I've got a wonderful international network as a result of this experience, but it doesn't include the students from the country I visited. There seemed to be this sort of big gap. At Stenden, we put local and international students together in cooperative group learning, and we tell them, get on with it. And what I've seen here at Stenden, I haven't seen at ever any other institution I've worked at. I see students after the formal classes still in mixed groups in the, in the canteen. They're still talking about their work. You see them sitting on these benches, and they're talking about work. You have to sort of be a bit rude and listen to what they're talking about. But the discussion is going on. And when we tested this, aspect with the international student barometer, the thing we did really well on was the international student saying, I can make friends with local students. We gave them a common purpose. We said, together you have to learn something. And so then they get together. So I think our principal pedagogical method makes us ideally suited to sort of push this internationalization and learn from it. And we have foreign staff at our international branch campuses. And they have ideas about that, what they teach from a totally different cultural context. So we're now making, creating mechanisms by which this can be shared. And so our programs become more and more internationally robust because they fit in not one, but in five different jurisdictions. That's a very powerful force. And of course, inter-campus mobility. We have, like every other institute of higher education, the exchange mechanisms, go and study for a half a year at uh, some other institution. But we can also send our students to one of the other campuses of Stenden. And that is growing. Cherki de Vries told me a little while ago, it's growing like Billio, way faster than the exchange mechanism. And these students, they're used to what they get in terms of education, so they can focus on the differences in the environment, the differences in the culture. And they do. You read their blogs, they're not concerned about 
What sort of exam am I going to get? How do they mark me? Where do I need to be? No, they know all that because they're still in Stenden, but they're in a very different environment with different teachers, different cultures. It's absolutely top. So I think Stenden is fit for purpose. So what am I going to do? Well, I've, I've, starting from this definition, it's reasonably clear what I need to do. Uh, engage the industries with which we, for which we produce students. Find out what it is they want in terms of international awareness.